so good afternoon everyone. My name is Wars Sekran and I have the pleasure to present you a very interesting topic which is called phacomatosis. So the introduction of this topic, so you should know the name that what derived from which so it's like has many syllables, so it has the first one which is phacos, means lens or spot or spot shape. The oma which denotes abnormal growth and also this pathology process. So combining them together, which is a pathology process that indicates abnormal growth of spot lesions or lens shaped lesions that are mainly noticed on the skin. So it's characterized by hereditary or sporadic hamartomas, and you all know hamartomas which involve abnormal development but within the normal content instead um, versus choristoma. So phacomatoses are hamartomas that characteristically involve organs and tissue of ectodermal origin. So it's mainly covered the skin, the eyes, and the nervous system. So that's the other name that can be called for, which is called neurocutaneous or neurocutaneous syndrome. Uh, it can affect any part of the body, but that these are the main targets. So it's mainly due to a genetic mutations that involve something called tumor suppressor genes, so tumor suppressor genes are very important because they encode proteins that can control the mitosis of normal cells and make them under tight control. So you all know that we have DNA and we have chromosomes that genes are part of that chromosomes and genes have many functions. Uh, one of the functions of the genes are called tumor suppressor genes. So, so we have something called transcription, so that's when the, when the RNA, messenger RNA goes into the nucleus and have a message taken from the DNA and then after that to go out of the nucleus to be translated into protein. So that's how we call uh, transcription and translation. So that's how is the genes relate or how are the genes related to the protein. Genes encode for proteins, genes has many different functions and one of the genes, one of the function of the genes are called tumor suppressor genes and its only function is to control the cell division and not make them go crazy and make them go under, like, under tight control. So you all know the common syndromes or common diseases of the phacomatosis which include NF1, 2 and tuber sclerosis. We have also VHL, Weber Mason and ataxia cylindricasia are considered as part common as part rare and we have many, many rare syndromes or diseases, but we're gonna concentrate on, on contentia pigmenti since it's related to ours. <coughs> so let's start with the first one. So I'm gonna analyze and divide the manifestation of each disease uh, based on its definition, which is neuroocleocutaneous. So it's gonna be skin manifestation, CNS uh, or nervous system plus systemic, and finally we'll go to our specialty, which is ocular manifestation. So we all know that NF1 is the commonest manifestation of neurocutaneous syndromes. Uh, it, it is having autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with complete penetrance and extremely variable expressivity. So we all know that what does it mean complete penetrance and this is all like specialized for autosomal dominant diseases which means that every patient or every person with the mutation they will show the signs or symptoms. That means complete penetrance. Variable expressivity, that means the target or the spectrum of the penetrance. Some patients, like they have very mild effect, but other patients may have very severe manifestation. So that's, that's uh, penetrance and expressivity. So about 50% of the patients present with no family history of NF1, which called de novo or somatic mutation. So, Although it's considered as an autosomal dominant disease, but half of the patients, they deny any family history of NF1, which can, which can be uh, understood that the patient, after the fertilization, the, the cells had developed a mutation after getting like normal genetic pattern. They have some mutation after the fertilization. That's what they call de novo or semantic mutation. Why that mutation happened after the fertilization, nobody knows. That's like that's opposed to the germline mutation, which the, pa the patients that they present with autosomal dominant disease and they have the autosomal or they have their disease manifestation. So that's somatic versus germline. 
So it's caused, again, as we saw in the drawing, so it's caused by a mutation in F1 gene. NF1 gene is part of the chromosome 17, and NF1 gene is, NF1 gene is important for protein production called neurofibromin. Neurofibromin is one of the tumor suppressor gene. So the diagnostic criteria for NF1, we're going to go like through the, these signs or symptoms. So starting with the skin manifestation, we have three. So skin is very important to NF1 for diagnosis. We have the cafe oil spots, which are the most common the skin finding, and they are characterized just like by flat lesions or macules, and they are pigmented. So cafe oil, everyone knows that it's coffee with milk, so it's like the same color. And it can increase in number and size by age. We have the, sec we have the second manifestation, which is frickling. Everyone can get frickling, especially in the sun-exposed areas, and it's due to increased melanin pigmentation. So if you pay attention, back to the diagnostic criteria, that's why they insist that the prickling should be in the axillary or inguinal region because these regions are not exposed into the sun. And the third characteristic region, which is neurofibroma, and hence the name neurofibromatosis. So they are, these regions are uh, elevated nodular regions having many cells, including Schwann cells or neural cells in general, in addition to fibroblastic cells, so neurofibroma, and hence the name. So, regarding the, the neurofibroma, it can be either small localized neurofibroma or plexiform. So we have the small localized is the most common, but having plexiform neurofibroma is a prerequisite for diagnosis of neurofibromatosis because it indicates uh, a worse involvement of the neurons. So the plexiform from the, from the terminology plexus because these hamartomas or the tumors they are forming like network or uh, mesh, network or plexus, so hence the, uh, the name plexiform. So these are the skin lesions, so you can see, so you can see the capiole spots, which are flat macules. You can have the frickling, and here it's in the axillary region. And these are small localized intraneural fibroma, but the neural fibroma can be also plexiform involving the lids. And that's how we can plexiform new problem uh, present, and here also as well. So that's considered as more severe form than this one. The nervous system and systemic manifestation. So we're gonna go through a lot of fake hematosis. I don't expect that all of you gonna like memorize all the defects because it's variable. But I'm gonna highlight the things that are very important, which are here because of the diagnostic criteria including bony defects, so including scoliosis, tibial cervical arthritis, and sphenoid bone dysplasia. So, and sphenoid bone dysplasia, can you pay attention for it because we're gonna see it right now. Uh, finally, regarding the ocular manifestations, we all know the ocular manifestations of NF1, and these in red are, the, are part of the diagnostic criteria. We have labdalition nodules, which are the most common ocular finding and they represent hamartoma of the iris pigmented epithelium and they develop, they are not usually congenital but they develop after like the age of two years. They are asymptomatic and they don't affect the vision but we have something that may threaten the vision which is optic pathway gly glioma which is considered as low grade which can present in up to 15 to 20 percent of the patients and this proliferation of glial cells, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So it has good prognosis. Other ocular manifestation that can affect its flexible neurofibroma of the lid, as we saw, glaucoma, and it has many mechanisms. It can, can be because of trabecular dysgenesis, or could be because of angle uh, obstruction by neurofibroma that block the angle. We have many, many other findings, include enlarged coronal nerve, conjunctival, uh, conjunctival neurofibroma, nodules, endocoroid, and retinal vascular abnormality, and pulsatile globe that I cannot show you in the photos, but Pulsatile globe because all we know that's because of the sphenoid bone dysplasia. So if you don't have absence of great or if you have absence of greater wing of sphenoid, that means you will have the transmission of the CSF pressure into the globe and that's why it's pulsatile. So again just to revise, these are the lesion viewers and you already know that the skin lesions, capiole, no fibroma, and the frequency. And these are radio imaging, so you can see on the left side, which is the optic nerve glioma, which is, as we said, it's low, it's good prognosis in only 20% of patients. Here, if you can compare, this is the sphenoid, or the greater wing of the sphenoid, 
And if you compare it to here, it's absent. That's why the globe is proptotic. And by examination, you will notice that the proptosis is falsified. Other manifestations, you have, as we said, conjunctival neurofibroma and enlarged corneal nerves. This is a part of intersection called infrared reflectance. So we all know that the retina and under it is the RPE and below it is the choroid. Because of the melanin pigment in the, in the RPE, a lot of like wide spectrum of light cannot penetrate, but this one this this is the advantage of the infrared because it can penetrate through the RPE and it can show you some regions that in the choroid more uh, enhanced than other modalities. Here this is very rare finding, which is called retinal microvessel tortuosity or retinal tortuosity. And here, if you can see, we have seen these arrows, which indicates a bright patches in the choroid, which is called the choroid and nodules. You can see it by the OCT as the absence of area of choroidal vessels that was taken by the nodules, but you can see it clearly by the infrared reflectance. So again. All patients with Baker mitosis, they need multi-team approach. They need uh, investigations for the whole body to make sure that there are no hematomas that cover other body parts. But in our, in, in, in regarding our field, we need to check about the intraocular pressure and optic nerve cupping because, as we said, that there was uh, an association with glaucoma. Uh, the other association that is optic nerve glioma. So many patients are children, and taking examination that depend on the patient's cooperation like visual equity and field may miss a lot of optic nerve glioma that is developing. So now they have, we have the advantage of the OCT that can show you the structural defect before any visual function compromised. So peripapillary OCT of the nerve fiber layer is the most reliable method of assessment to detect subclinical atrophy. Because as you know, not all optic nerve glioma they have optic nerve swelling, especially if it's like very posterior, because of the compression, long-standing compression, you will have a secondary atrophy. And if you have atrophy, that means too late. Uh, finally, the surgical excision of lexical neurofibroma, especially if children, if they have mechanical ptosis because of the lesion. So, going to the second one, NF2, which is like the brother of NF1, but it's much, much rare. Uh, it's an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Again, complete penetrance, that means all patients will show uh, all patients with mutation will show findings, but the findings are variable. About 50% again of the patients present with no family history of NF2, as, and as we said that because of de novo muta or somatic mutation that the patient has taken normal egg and normal sperm, but mutation happened afterwards, which is called somatic. So it's caused again by mutation of NF2 gene, which is part of chromosome 22, and that gene encode for protein Merlin or schwannoma, which is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, so skin is not that much important, especially if the from the, for the diagnostic criteria of NF2. So the main finding in NF2, as we know that it's bilateral vestibular schwannoma, that if you have it, you don't need any other finding. Uh, if you have a first degree relative with NF2, but you have the unilateral vestibular schwannoma, or other, other tumors, we're gonna go through it, uh, that's also considered as, uh, as uh, an enough. So, let's go systematically as we said, as we go through the NF1. So, skin manifestations, they, in F2, they resemble the skin manifestations in F1. But they are very less characteristic and they are not pronounced or pathognomonic as in NF1. So you can have the cafe all spot, although the shape of it, it's not uh, as characteristic because it's a little bit larger and have irregular border. You can have the neurofibroma, and it is the most common dermatologic manifestation, and least common is the prickling. I just brought here the, one of the reports that showed cafe all spot in patients with confirmed NF2. And you can see it's a little bit large, irregular. And this is the new fibroma, and it's nodular. Can resemble the NF1, but it's a little bit more pronounced than NF1. Uh, so, diagnosis of NF2 is mainly based on the tumors. So, the tumors, which is most likely, any tumor can happen in patients with NF2. Uh, 
and most likely they will have either schwannoma or the last one which is meningioma. So neurofibromatosis, that's, these are the two most common tumors that can present. So most likely schwannoma followed by meningioma or followed by any other tumors. So the most common site for schwannoma to involve in patient with NF2 is the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is the eighth nerve. So that's the name vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma, which is the second name. So it's almost a universal finding in any patient with NF2. The patient, because of the vestibular involvement, the patient, the patient can usually present with hearing loss, tinnitus, and imbalance because of the effect of the schwannoma affecting the vestibular nerve. And this is the most common mode of presentation in NF2 because that's the most common tumor that happens in NF2. Other manifestations can happen which include headache, seizures, and because of the intracranial mass effect, our irritation effect, or in addition to weakness or paralysis due to the ependymon. So, this is uh, how it looks like a vestibular schwannoma, but just pay attention, it's unilateral. So, if the patient presented with only this lesion, that's still not considered as, still not enough to diagnose with NF2, unless you have a family degree, you should have bilateral vestibular schwannoma, which is the characteristic finding in patients with NF2. And this is spinal, so spinal ebendimoma. Ebendimal cells, if you know, that they are glial cells that are located around the CSF, mainly in the ventricles. And any enlargement of the ebendimal cells is called ebendimoma because of the CSF is filling the spine. That's why ebendimal cells are prevalent, and you can have ebendimoma in patients with NF2. The last thing, focular manifestation of NF2, which is combined hamartoma, as we know, of the retina and the RPE and a peritoneal membrane. So combined hamartoma, as we know, that it's abnormal proliferation of the glial, vascular, and RPE. So it lacks abnormal proliferation of the retina and the RPE, which is the component of the retina and the RPE. The fluorescein angiography showed, can show early hypofluorescence because, as we know, that you have pigment epithelial cells and pigment what to, to do with FFA. It block the, uh, the transmission. Uh, in late phase, because of the changes in the overlying vessels, sometimes you can have leakage and late hyperfluorescence. Uh, OCT can show retinal disorganization and in addition to possible associated uh, retinal membrane. Any complication, any fibrotic lesions that involve the retina, it can have with the secondary complication. Although it's rare, but it can happen because either because of the fibrous proliferation or because of the vascular changes overlying the hematoma. So you can have CMBM, which is hemorrhage, exudation, retinous cases, and detachment. Epiretinal membrane pathologically resembles combined hematoma, but it may just represent a less severity. That's why we have them together sometimes. So this is the photography of the combined hematoma. So you can see the disorganization of the retinal layers. You have proliferation of fibroblasts, pigmented cells, and some changes on the vasculature. Uh, in the FFA, you can sh see that the vascular changes overlying the, the tumor over the mass. That's why it's responsible for the late leakage. And you can see it's, it can be like as an, a picture of the retinal membrane, but usually the OCT can differentiate because you have more disorganization of the retina based on the OCT compared to, to just a retinal membrane. And this is just a simple retinal membrane and it shows that it's less in severity, so it could be like the same pathologic process, but different spectrum. These are the most, thing that's, that they are the most common thing that we are seeing, but they are not in the diagnostic criteria of neurofibromatosis 2. So the, the diagnostic criteria that can be involved in regard to the ocular side, it includes either early cataract, which is classically shown as posterior subcapsular or cortical cataract, and the, the, the thing that also involves the eyes, which is the optic nerve sheath meningioma. And this is in contrast to glioma, as we know, because glioma is proliferation of glial cells, that is a proliferation of the nerve itself. This is in contrast to meningioma, which is proliferation of the meningothelial cells that are around the optic nerve. But again, you can have also optic nerve glioma, you can have any optic disc lesions, including morning glory, and you can have also patholedema and cranial nerve palsy as in NF1 because of what? Because you have mass effect uh, and secondary rise of the intraocular pressure. So this is the early posterior subcapsular cataract that can happen in the patient. And this is the, the meningioma that as you can see 
and you can see it by the corona much better because it indicates proliferation just around the nerves rather than the nerve itself. And because of that, you can have also secondary proptosis. And this is morning glory. Just brought the picture of the flower, just so you will not forget. So the ocular management is, again, as in patients with phacomatosis, uh, it includes multi-team approach. Patients with NF2 should also undergo multiple neuroimaging to rule out any systemic hematoma. In regard to our side, again, because of that optic nerve meningioma, you should have visual acuity and field assessment in addition to hurtle to make sure that you don't have any visual compromise because of that. Surgical excision has been proposed if the patient develops significant proliferation or secondary complication of the hematoma, and the results showed that one, the prognosis was good. Uh, anti vgf was tried for associated CMVM, if there was any CMVM developed because of the combined hematoma, and uh, it was short, short favorable, favorable prognosis. And also management of cataract and refractive error, as we said, because it's an early, and we want to avoid employable in uh, children. So the third one, which is tuber sclerosis, again, it has the same characteristic, which is autosomal dominant. Actually here, the de novo mutation, it's much more, because it can reach to up to 84% of patients. They don't have any family history whatsoever of, sorry, this is a mistake, with tuber sclerosis. And it's caused either by mutation either of TSC1 or TSC2, and these two genes are encoding for protein hamartin and tuberin, respectively. So the diagnostic criteria and the findings in tuber sclerosis are, are much, much more than NF1 or NF2. But you should have, uh, uh, just to summarize, just to, you should have either two major features uh, from, this, from the schedule, or you should have just one major and two minor. And we'll go through it. So again, systematically, we'll go with the skin. Skin manifestation, it can happen with hyperpigmented or hypomelanotic macules, which is called ash leaf spots. This is the most common skin finding. It's just like the cathy oil spot, but it's like the, the white version. Uh, confetti skin lesions, which is as uh, the ash leaf spots, but it's just like dispersed. They are dispersed small and depigmented. Uh, they are much, much more uh, in prevalence than uh, hyperpigmented molecules if, if they develop. Angiofibroma, so angiofibroma can happen mainly on the skin, on, on the face and mainly on the butterfly distribution of the face, and it's considered as proliferation of dendritic cells, fibroblastic cells, and vascular telangiectasia, hence the name angiofibroma. First, before it was considered as adenoma sebaceum, but it was found that it was uh, incorrect. Chagrin patches, which is flesh-colored with rough surface. Chagrin means uh, not smooth, uh, so it's flesh-colored with rough surface. Mainly you can see it on the lower back, and fibroma if it involves that nails just adjacent to it or below it. So you can see here the ash leaf spots or the hyperpigmented molecules. It mimics just like the ash leaf. And these are the small legions that we talked about, which is called confetti skin legion. This is considered as minor. You cannot see it like in many patients as in this one, which is characteristic of the tuber sclerosis. Again, with the finding, you can see the angiofibroma. So just remember angiofibroma and tuber sclerosis, neurofibroma in NF1 or 2. This is an angiofibroma, and taking that butterfly distribution, you can see it as like nodules with vascular telangiectasia around it. This is the chagrin patch, which is again in indicates that flesh that is not smooth or rough. Usually you can see it in the lower back, and this is the angle fibroma, which is developed in the nerve. It has many things in the nervous or systemic manifestation. Just to mention about the tuber sclerosis, the terminology is it, because it was derived from the tubers. Tubers means protuberance or overgrowth of a tissue. And because it was noted on the imaging, that's why, that's why that it was named tuber sclerosis, because it indicates an abnormal or protrusion of tissue that is hard, tuber sclerosis. Also, they can have subependymal nodules and subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. These changes can, cha can, can show manifest, many, many manifestations, but the most common is that to have secondary tertiary calcification, which lead to epilepsy and mental retardation. And you, can, and you have many visceral components. You can see also dental, pulmonary, renal, or cardiac. So 
these are the tubers because it was noted on the imaging. It indicates that a sclerosis of abnormal development of, of protrusion. And this is considered as tuber migration lines. And these are radiological findings. The second thing is that this is the giant astrocytoma. And this is the sub nodules. And as we said, because in Bendema we said that it's around or located near the ventricles or the CSF, you can have nodularity here in this region with the tuber sclerosis. Uh, this is can uh, this is the patient can present with cardiac rhabdomyoma, rhabdomyoma. That's why the patient should be investigated thoroughly. Uh, angiomyolipoma, and this is cons uh, this is the finding of uh, enamel pet, which is like a hole in this uh, on the teeth, and this is the fibroma that around, that's present in the oral cavity. Uh, ocular manifestation: it can have retinal astrocytic hamartoma. Retinal astrocytic hematoma is the same. So it's development of glial cells in addition to blood vessels. And they are characteristically like frequently found in nerve fiber layer, but it can involve even other parts of the or other layers of the retina. They can present as flat or multinodular, although we know the multinodular, but flats are the most common that can be seen in tuberous sclerosis. Why it's not the problem is that with the flat hematoma that say, they are sometimes difficult to diagnose because they are flat on the retinal surface, but the thing that can give it away, which is uh, the obscuration of the blood vessel. So that's why, because of the obscuration of blood vessel, you can have secondary vitreous hemorrhage. The main differential diagnosis, as we know, it could be myelinated nerve fiber layer, and a lot of cases were found to be flat hematoma. The thing that is, we can see most of the time is the multilandular hematoma, of the characteristic the region is multilandular hematoma, which is considered as maybe a transition of the flat hamartoma, but they develop like calcification afterwards and being nodular so they can be easy to identify. And because of the calcification, you will find it as hyperechogenic uh, mass with posterior shadowing. If the optic of the multinodular hamartoma was found to be near the optic disc, again, a lot of cases were found, uh, were diagnosed with optic disc dosing, but it was found to be at, uh, multi, or multinodular hamartoma due to tuber sclerosis because of the calcification that came to it. So it can be complicated again. It's almost the same as the other phacomatosis, CNVM, vitreous hemorrhage, exudation, or retinal de detachment, although it's very, very rare to have it because all, most of the lesions are stable. So we'll go through it. So this is the OCT. You can, sh you can see the thickening of the NFL, and this is how it presents. The thing that gave it away, as I said, it's the obscuration or the covering of the blood vessel. Uh, you may have it as a calcification afterwards, and you can see the calcification here. And also in here. So that's why, like, missing as a uh, multinodular hematoma, it's not common, but missing these are much common and they delay the diagnosis. This is the autofluorescence. You can see it's calcified. That's okay. You can see it and pick it up easily. But how, this is how it presents with flat lesions because they lack calcification. And you can see a lot of some lesions also here. So this is also the B-scan. If you have calcification, that it will show hyper epigenicity with posterior shadowing. And this is how it shows in FFA because, again, as we said on the combined hamartoma, because you have some component of pigmentation, you will have blockage early. But because you have secondary vascular changes overlying or adjacent to the uh, tumor or the mass, you will have late leakage. This is another finding that was uh, added to the tuber sclerosis um, uh, diagnostic criteria, which is very rare, which is called punched out lesion or retinal achromatic patches. It's very rare, and it may most likely resemble an RBE pigmentation that is that are well demarcated. So again, as in any phacomatosis, multi team approach, they should go under, uh, and they will undergo a systemic investigation. And retinal assessment is necessary because, as I said, that uh, most likely they are stable, but you should uh, pay attention to complications. Surgical excision has been tried for the astrocytic hematoma with PPP and membrane peeling, and it showed favorable uh, prognosis and good outcome. Anterior VEGF again is needed in cases of CMBM. This is the new, like this is, these are new indications that was given before for sub ependymal nodules that associated with tuber sclerosis. But it, in studies found that even if they given for that, 
combined hamartoma thickness, or sorry, the astrocytic hamartoma, uh, it decreases in thickness. The fourth thing, VHL. So VHL is also one of the rarest, rarest manifestation. It has the same characteristic of, other, of the previous trichomatosis, which is an autosomal dominant. Here it's high penetrance. So as we said, if you have high penetrance in 90%, as in this sentence, that means 90% of the patient they will have, if they have the mutation, they will have manifestations. And 10% of the patients with the mutation, they will be considered lucky because they don't have any manifestation. So that means penetrance. So it's caused by mutation of the BHL gene that could located in chromosome 3 and the BHL gene in code for protein B VHL. So VHL is important because it leads to, uh, mutation leads to upregulation of hypoxia induced factors. And that hypoxia induced factor can induce increased expression of the tumor, uh, uh, tumor and genetic molecules such as VGF, uh, related drug growth factor, and transforming growth factor. Uh, Family history is also important here in uh, tuber and uh, VHL. So if you have just one, uh, you have positive family history, you are enough just for, for one lesion, either in the retina, in the brain, or the viscera. If you have negative, that will be more effort because you should compensate for the negative family history with two or more lesions, either in the retina or in the brain. But at least you should have one of them present in addition to the visceral tumor. So that's important. Luckily, we don't have skin manifestations here. So regarding the nervous or systemic manifestation, they are a lot. And just starting with the CNS, most the characteristic lesion that you can find in imaging of the CNS is the hemangioblastoma. That can involve any part of the CNS, but typically it either involves the cerebellum or the spinal cord. Spinal cord less likely, but cerebellum is the characteristic lesion. And the mean age of the cerebellar involvement is 35 years. So they are, these changes are not congenital. Renal is important because you might be asked for that because the renal cell or renal cancer is the most common cause of mortality, although it's only in 30%. So it's less prevalent, but they are the most lethal. Pancreatic you can have, you can have adrenal and neuroendocrine, especially with secondary pheochromocytoma. And that's why these patients, they can present with tachycardia, hypertension, sweating because of the sympathetic drive. Uh, there's something called indolent sac tumors, which are present in the diagnostic criterion VHL. And these tumors involving the auricular structures, such as the cochlea and semicircular canal. And that's why the patient, these patients can present with hearing loss and imbalance. Hearing loss and imbalance. Imbalance also can be responsible because of the cerebellar hemangioblastoma, as we know. So, this is how the cerebellar hemangioblastoma can present, and this is hemangioblastoma that involves the spinal cord. So, the characteristic finding in our side is the retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. The mean age of involvement all, all like resembles clearly the renal involvement, which is 25 years. It's the same here. It presents with protruding vascular mass, as we know it, which, which is red to orange, and associated feeding artery and draining vein. It can be located either in the periphery or in the peripapillary area. And the peripapillary area, sometimes it's associated with delayed diagnosis because some patients were labeled as NVD. So it can be complicated by exudation, hemorrhage, and traction retinal attachment as any phacomatosis lesion that involves the retina. FFA show early filling of the feeding artery because it's large, tortuous, and it show high flow in these vessels. So it will show early filling of the feeding artery uh, going to the vascular tumor, and after that, because it's fast flow, it will show also fast draining uh, of the tumor by the draining vein. Active lesions, because these lesions need a treatment, but in follow-up, active lesions, you know it by FFA because it will show still persistent lesions. OCT can show possible associated subretinal and interretinal fluid if you have a leakage or active lesion. Again, you have <coughs> you can have other uh, other findings such as nystagmus and saccadic abnormalities, and because of that, we know it involves the cerebellum, and because cerebellum hemangioplastoma is very common in VHL. Also, you can have papilledema and cranial nerve pulses. These are not specific, they are not characteristic of any phacomatosis. Again, because if you have any brain lesion, it may increase the intracranial pressure, and you will have optic nerve swelling or any cranial nerve pulses. Okay, and these are the, le the lesions. You can see it as red to orange, and you can see the draining vessels, or the feeding and draining vessels. 
this is how you can see it on the FFA. This is very huge uh, capillary hemangioblastoma. And you can see how the feeding and the brain uh, supplying or going to the, to the tumor itself. If you have a leakage, you will have a secondary edema because of the leakage. So the, this lesion should be treated. So again, I'm going to repeat this slide all over. So it needs multi-team approach. DHL patients should have a systemic investigation and imaging. Retinal assessment is necessary. So in any patient with DHL, it's just advice, do FFA. Because you may miss a small retinal capillary hemangioma that is not visible by clinical examination. FFA is very, very important. If you have a small lesion, you should have, you can treat them with laser photocoagulation. Larger lesion can be treated with cryotherapy, especially if you have extensive fluid that you know that laser it might not work there. Or photodynamic therapy, especially for these lesions that you are afraid from that laser photocoagulation that it might damage. So you can have photodynamic therapy for juxtapapillary lesion. So the target is to treat the active hemangioma because as we know that these interventions in regard to laser photocoagulation or cryotherapy are associated with post-intervention inflammation. So most of the patients, if they have treated, they can be having also intravitreal steroid. But these, change, these uh, additional uh, uh, steps can be taken for large hemangioma because small lesions that just need laser photocoagulation, we don't think that it might induce significant inflammation. So, intravitreal anti vegf may decrease the exudation and found good outcome, and PBB for vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachment, uh, as we know. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So, going, we are about to finish. So, we have the, the the, thing, uh, the, the other phacomatosis, which is Serge Weber syndrome, it's less in common compared to the typical or characteristic phacomatosis. This is considered unique because it's one of the phacomatosis that have sporadic disease with no inheritance pattern. But the same pathologic process, you have a mutation that happened that involved one of the gene that's important for tumor suppressor gene or vascular mutilation gene which is called GNAQ gene, located in chromosome 9, and that gene encode for protein G alpha Q. So that protein is very important because it, it helps to regulate the development and function of blood vessels, and its mutation leads to inappropriate control, which means you have also as mitosis or cell division in the best culture, and that should be also under tight control, and if you don't have that protein, the blood vessel is going to go crazy with the cell division and mitosis, and you will have this thing. So again, skin manifestation, all we know that it's considered, uh, the characteristic living is patient angioma. Uh, it's also called port wine stain or nevus flam flamus. It's well delineated, red macule, and it's congenital, which is uh, against uh, the second uh, skin finding that mimic it, which is uh, capillary hemangioma, or skin capillary hemangioma. It may get darker and thicker with age. They are also they typically uh, involve the V1 and V2 of the trigeminal nerve. And the more extensive the skin lesion, the more likely to be associated with glaucoma and neurologic manifestation. So this is a picture. You can see the nevus flamus. It's congenital. It's at birth. And with time, it might get, get thicker, hyperpigmented, and you can have like some hypertrophy of that area. Uh, in regard to the nervous or systemic manifestations, you can have CNS, leptomeningeal vascular malformation, so as the same that you have it on your skin, which is angioma, you can have angioma in your brain. So these congenital lesions are associated also with calcification. Again, you can have any of these symptoms or signs, which are called, uh, including epilepsy, developmental delay, and mental retardation, which resemble this finding in TSC. It's usually, these changes usually epsilator to the side of port wine stain, but you can have, by imaging, you can have bilateral involvement and only one side of facial angioma. One-sided lesion will produce, as we know, contralateral signs because of the decosated or crossed innervation, and it's usually involving the occipital and parietal loops. And this is how we can see it in imaging. In regard to ocular manifestation, you can have choroidal hemangioma, which is diffuse. 
So choroidal hemangioma, as we know, it can be diffuse or localized. Localized, you can see it in patients other than Sturge It can be incidental, but in uh, Sturge they have characterized, characterized by diffuse. And it's present in about 40% of the cases. Because it's a diffuse, you will have some difficulty in diagnosing these cases. Why? Because you will not have the contrast difference when compared with, with localized choroidal hemangioma that can be clearly delineated. Uh, it can be complicated by exclusive RD, cystoid edema, choroidal detachment, and special consideration here that it might increase the risk of glaucoma and subrachoidal hemorrhage, and that's very important. So B scan can be, uh, can be investigated or taken or uh, ordered for these patients, which usually show markedly thickened choroid, and medium to high internal reflectivity, re reflectivity as we know, with an overlying RV if present. So, uh, it's not clear actually. So, you can see that maybe you can compare the uh, red reflex or the pandas appears or pandas color when you compare this one to this one. Actually, it's clear in the, in the slides, but it's not here. But you can see that it's like more red and it's diffused. And if there is any second clue, you can see the optic nerve carbon here, compared to the other. Uh, you may also have an, a secondary exudative RD, and which is confirmed by the, by the B scan, which shows thickened choroid with secondary RD, and with active DG, you will have uh, subretinal fluid and secondary interretinal fluid. The second ocular manifestation is the glaucoma, and it it can be happening for many uh, reasons. It could be congenital. Again, because the changes are congenital, and glaucoma can, so, can also be congenital in here, because of the angle maldevelopment, or could be acquired because of the long-standing elevated vascular venous pressure. It can be also associated with vascularization of the iris and trabecular meshwork that may cause secondary angle closure. But this is very, yeah, this is this is, has been reported, but it's very rare. The involvement of the upper lid by the skin and geoma, it was found to increase the risk of glaucoma. And maybe I forgot to mention, so just to remind to remind you that plexiform neurofibroma or lid neurofibroma that neurofibroma that involves the upper lid increase the risk of glaucoma. Also here, if you have a skin and geoma that involves the upper lid, you will have increased risk of glaucoma. So you will not forget it. In congenital variant, it will be associated with both thymus and corneal haze, as any case with congenital glaucoma. And again, because of the other manifestations that they are not specific, it could be contralateral hemianopia, because as we mentioned, uh, the angioma likes the parietal and occipital lobe, and it might have contralateral hemianopia. You can have iris heterochromia being darker on the epsilateral side, and the elective is clear of And you can see here again, the color I'm not delineated here, but you can see it's a little bit darker on this side compared to this side. And you can have the dilated vascular vessels, which represent uh, just small angiomas. Uh, again, you should check and make sure, but because surge river syndrome, they are a little bit considered uh, differently because you have the risk of glaucoma. And intraocular pressure assessment and the assessment of the optic nerve morphology and cubbing is very, very important. And be, uh, be aware of these patients because any ocular surgery, especially glaucoma filtration surgery, as we know, it increases the risk of subrachoroidal hemorrhage. Retinal assessment is necessary, especially with OCT and B scan, to detect any subretinal fluid that indicates active hemangioma. The main treatment of these lesions is radiation therapy. BDT usually is preserved for localized choroidal hemangioma. But in studies found that multiple sessions of BDT especially covering the, the highest tumor thickness, it might play a role, especially if you don't have radiation therapy. And it showed good outcome. Systemic propanol, or which is non-selective beta blocker, has been uh, tried before, and it was found to be, to be effective in reducing the subretinal fluid. But what's the mechanism? Nobody knows. Because maybe they said it's modulate the vasculature and the vascular permeability, and it might affect the vasculogenesis. Uh, so we have 15 minutes. I'm going to go uh, quickly because we finished the characteristic of the typical lesions. Weber Mason, it has in common uh, with Sturt Weber that it's being sporadic, but the other unique finding in Weber Mason, but there are no genetic pattern that was found for this disease. So 
it's characterized by congenital lesion that's uh, associated with arterial venous malformation of the face, retina, and brain. AVM, which is arterial venous malformation, is defined, as we know, as a direct communication between an artery and vein, but no capillaries that are present so can regulate the pressure. So the direct or the arterial pressure is transmitted directly to the venous pressure, which is abnormal because of the absence of the capillaries. So skin manifestation, you can have IVM in the face, it's very rare incidence, and you can have it in here. You, have, you can have also CNS, uh, AVM can happen in anywhere in the CNS, but it was found that midbrain is the most characteristic lesion, the location, and it can have many, many manifestations in secondary for that, including seizures, headache, hemiparesis, cranial neuropathy, as we mentioned. Uh, arterial venous malformation can also be located anywhere outside the central nervous system, and that's why the, these patients are developing other bleeding uh, manifestation like hematuria, hemoptysis, epast, epistaxis, and frank bleeding. Uh, and also the reports mentioned that these patients, they should be care, they should be taken into special consideration because when they have like just small intervention like dental procedure, they will have huge bleeding. And this is how it, the ABM can present on the CNS, and you can see it as dilated tortuous abnormal blood vessels. Retinal arterial venous malformation, it's usually unilateral, but can happen in bilateral. Uh, usually it will show rapid filling of the vascular normality, but there is no significant leakage. And OCT can show the associated retinal edema, but complications can happen, which was found because the patient can have hemorrhage, occlude, venous occlusion, optic disc edema, because they found that maybe with long-standing arterial venous malformation, especially for localized cases that you have capillary adjacent to that lesion, they will not stand the high pressure, and it might show the finding, or the secondary findings. And this is how it presents. You can see it in here, as a localized. It's normal on here, but here, also over the overlying the optic disc. And here you can see it, but I, I brought it here because you can see that there was, there was no vascular leakage, and you can see the delineation of the blood vessel and the retinal thickening because of that. Orbital. AVM, which is the second ocular component that we might see, uh, it's very rare compared to the retinal arterial venous malformation, but the significant significance here because it may lead to proptosis, which is pulsatile because, as we know, it's a vascular uh, tumor and associated with bruising. So, if you remember that the pulsatile proptosis that we found in F1, it's pulsatile, but there are no bruising because it transmits the CSF. This is a vascular region and so it will be associated with pulsatile uh, nature and the bone. And other also manifestations, so we can see here the orbital ABM, it's not clear actually, but you can see that there are some component of proptosis. Uh, here you can, again, you involve the multi-team approach, pan written photocoagulation, as we, as we mentioned that most of the lesions are stable, but you may have rare complication. In cases of retinal ischemia, you may have, uh, you, sh you should have the pan-retinal photocoagulation in addition to anti vegf if you have any vascularization because of the rare complication, which is secondary vitreous hemorrhage uh, or TRD, you should employ the PVB. In regard to the orbital EVM, embolization or surgical excision can be employed to reduce the proptosis. Ataxetyl injectase, I'm going through it. Uh, this is this is the only thing that we're going to discuss that has autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. So we have autosomal dominant, we have sporadic, which is Sturge Weber and Weber Mason, and this is the only autosomal recessive that we discussed. And it's all caused by mutation of the ATM gene, chromosome 11, and protein ATM. So these patients, just to go through it, this, these patients, they have a mutation of the ATM gene. ATM gene is not only tumor suppressor gene. ATM gene is like very important because it might uh, or just it fix the breaks or the lesion that might happen to our DNA. Because we are exposed like to ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet light or sunlight, micro damages can happen to our DNA. And this is, can be uh, gone un unnoticed because we have this 24 hour maintenance because of these genes. But these patients, they born normal. But because of the environmental exposure and excessive expi environmental exposure, especially for sunlight and ultraviolet light, uh, light rays, they cannot fix the damage that can happen and cumulative damage will happen until the patient can present later on. 
So ATM protein is important to cellular DNA repair, and that's why explaining the propensity that the patient are already sensitive and they can have development of cancer. So if you have a damaged DNA or a broken DNA, the rules that these proteins employ that stop dividing, it will not apply, uh, uh, apply to them because they are not following the rules anymore. They are broken or damaged. So either you have an under division, so the cells like will die without any further division that can keep the structure, or you might have an over division that might lead to secondary cancer. So also ATM is important for immunoglobulin protection and lymphoid cell survival. That's why they have these patients are having the risk or the chance of immune deficiency. So the the things that we are seeing in ataxia telangiectasia is first of all is the telangiectasia and the skin manifestation. It's present about in about five uh, about hundred percent over age of six years. They are born normal, but because of the uh, continuous environmental exposure, they develop this because the broken DNA gets higher more and more and more. And it's characterized by abnormal dilation of the blood vessels and capillaries on the skin. And this is how it presents on the skin. And regarding to the nervous uh, system manifestation, the, the thing that I want you to remember is that cerebellar atrophy, because they ask about that a lot. And this is the characteristic finding that can happen in patients with ataxia injectasia. As we know that immune system, because of uh, immunity, is uh, immunity is compromised and you don't have the uh, production of the immunoglobulin, that these patients, they are at risk of infection. Endocrine also has been reported, and, uh, including diabetes mellitus, gonadal failure, and growth hormone deficiency, and secondary tumor, as we said, especially lymphoma and leukemia, because these cells gone crazy and they are not following the rules of cell division, and they are dividing without any control. And this is the cerebellar atrophy that can be noticed in radiographic imaging. Uh, ocular manifestation, it involves conjunctival telangiectasia and oculometer apraxia. These are the characteristic findings that can happen in ocular uh, tissue or orbital tissue uh, that involve, uh, involve us. The conjunctival telangiectasia is more common, but oculometer apraxia has been reported to be associated with ataxia telangiectasia. So ataxia telen uh, oculometer apraxia, as we know, because you should have control or ability to have control of looking to the sides and to shift your gaze and that's mediated by a neurological process because of the CNS involvement the patients will not cannot do involuntary control and they always fix on, on uh, straight ahead to fix or to change the gaze they hold always they try to move their head so they can compensate the defect on the ocular shift gaze Nystagmus and saccadic abnormalities, as we said, because of the cerebral involvement. And this is how a conjunctival telangiectasia happens and manifests, and this is the most characteristic skin finding. And if you have any patient with oculometra abraxia, they always say, examine the conjunctival because you may have some conjunctival telangiectasia that can, give the, can diagnose these patients. Supportive. So, in contentia pigmenti, I will not go through it because. I can see you, you are struggling. So I'm gonna go this with the skin legion. Just remember that on contentia pigmenti, they are, it's one of the differential diagnoses of peripheral ischemia and new vascularization, especially in children. And that's considered uh, given as an ROP-like picture. It's usually, it's, it's an X-linked dominant, and that's important because it's more common in females. So. We need the X gene to survive. Female, they have X, two Xs, but we are, male, we have two X and Y. If they have X-linked dominant disease that affecting the male, he cannot survive with that. So that's why it's lethal. But X-linked dominant, so that's why it's usually seen more common in female. So it's the same rule. It's the protein that's involved with the NEMO gene is tumor suppression, regulating inflammation, just to make sure uh, how about the finding? So you can have these skin lesions, especially if you have a, f um, uh, a female or a young girl that's presented at age of five to six. They presented with these skin lesions. You can have just like a blisters or vesicles, and followed by hyperpigmentation or hyperpigmentation. Uh, these are the stages here. Don't develop them until 
the ruckus part and then hyperpigmentation and then hypopigmentation. It's like a process, it's like a journey. And uh, the incontentia pigmenti, let's go to that. Let's go to the written. And we'll go back to the CMS. So, you know, as we said, it's an RP like picture. They have the retinal number perfusion, including ischemia, new vascularization, hemorrhage, and associated traction or combined traction or rheumatogenic detachment. So, I'm just like describing exactly how the findings come with ROP. Central retinal ischemia can happen, but it was documented, but it was very rare and leading to macular ischemia, which is highlighted by enlarged phobia, a vascular zone, and FFA. And because of that, of the ischemia, there will be a vascular or secondary vascular remodeling, and then you will have a blunted foveal pit. So you will not have the foveal depression or normal foveal depression. And other findings can also present. Uh, and these are the findings. So you just can see, just we are seeing like a picture of ROP. You can see a peripheral lung perfusion, peripheral new vascularization, and because of the leakage, and you can have a secondary component of traction because of the long-standing new ischemia and new vascularization inducing fibrosis and secondary traction attachment. In here, you can see that you cannot delineate the phobia. This is called the blunted, pho blunted phobia pit or phobia plana. That's because there was an ischemia in this area, then a vascular remodeling and making the architecture or the structure of the phobia And it's the same approach for ROP. It's PRP or cryo for cases of retinal ischemia and vascularization. anti vigif has been reported to be effective in vascularization, but it's still debatable because the number of cases is not that much. PPV plus minus kilobuckle in cases of persistent vitreous hemorrhage or RD. Uh, that's it. I apologize because the topic is very, very heavy. And I don't expect that anyone like memorized everything in here. So just if there's anyone like interested to have the slides, I just send someone to contact me and then I'm gonna like email it to you. Thank you so much.